Good morning, Church, and welcome to Subic Bay Community of Faith Sunday online service. And today is November 8th, which means that Christmas is just around the corner. And wow, where has our year gone? I remember waking up January, now it's November. In a couple of more days, the year would end as well. Anyway, let me be the first to greet you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. As we approach the day of the birth of our Lord, I pray that we remain joyful and faithful in our daily walk and in encouraging each other as often as possible. Speaking of joy, another joyful event is happening this month. Well, for my family at least, my nephew is turning one in a couple of weeks and we are excited about that. And I remember last year, the day he was born, it was the happiest moment for my brother and his wife, and also for us. You could see it in their faces, their smiles from ear to ear, and you can hear it in their professed excitement in caring and growing this child proper into this world. You know, from the very beginning, they were aware how much of a blessing it is having a child. And they were also aware of their responsibility in caring and nurturing their baby. And then, progressively ensuring that their child is trained properly as he aged and get equipped to one day emerge as an adult and stand on his own. A child's birth is almost the same as when we have new believers, new believers that we welcome into our faith. We have overflowing joy knowing that the souls of these people are being saved. You know, but it doesn't stop there and it shouldn't stop there. Like babies, those new into the faith also need a hand to help them in their walk with God until they mature to the point that one day they can do the same for others. Those new in the faith require spiritual mentors, people who would encourage them in their walk, guide them in their questions, and enlighten them through their mistakes. And also help them point, in, point them into the right direction towards God which is very, very important. Today, church, we will see how Paul and Barnabas displayed this and modeled this during their last leg of their missionary journey. The title of our message today is Emerged, episode four of our third season in the book of Acts, Intentional Church Beyond Borders. Our passage for today is found in Acts 14, verses 21 to 28. But before we dig into the scripture, let us commit ourselves to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, thank you again for this another day, for this wonderful day that we are able to bask in your glory, Lord. and We are able to dig deeper into your word, Father God. Lord, we ask you right now to be in our hearts, to be in the center of what we're going to do. Open our hearts and our minds so that we may understand your message to us today. And we cannot do this, Lord, without the help of your Holy Spirit, and without the help of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. Again, Lord, we pray that you continuously guide us and continuously give us wisdom. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. The focus of our message today is this. Be intentional in prioritizing discipleship. Let me repeat that. Be intentional in prioritizing discipleship. Now, let's take a closer look at our first point, caring for the disciples. Before we get into this, let us first define what discipleship is within the context of our church. SBCF. For us, discipleship is living a life of absolute surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ by intentionally knowing, loving, following, and serving Him. Now, I want you to keep this in mind as we go through our today's passage. Now, if you remember in our previous sermon, Acts 14 verses 1 to 20, we saw how Paul and Barnabas were treated in Lystra. 
They were first treated as gods when the people saw them perform a miraculous act. And then it quickly changed after several jealous Jews turned the people against them and led them to stone Paul, leaving him for dead. Now, after this ordeal of Paul and Barnabas, they then moved on to a city called Derby, to which they preached the gospel in that city. It was written that they won a large crowd or a large number of people for the cause of Christ, which is wonderful. Then they did something absolutely confounding, something that I even questioned. In verse 21, we can see that instead of avoiding the places in which their lives were put in danger, they actually decided to go back to the cities where their lives were put at risk. I think you can ask any logical person if the populace of a town tried to kill you, most likely you won't ever go back there, right? I won't. Scary. But Paul's missionary mindset caused them to do otherwise. Let's do a quick review of the events that took place. So in Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel in the synagogues until a mob of angry Jews heaped abuse on them, ultimately expelling them from the region. The next city, Iconium, they spent some time sharing the gospel as well, but they fled when they, attended, when they attempted to stone them. See the pattern? They keep on getting stoned. Now, the third city, Lystra, the one that we talked about last week. Paul healed a lame man, but was then stoned until near death. Wow. I asked myself, you know, why would Paul and Barnabas backtrack to those cities? I'll tell you why. It was because they were intentional and genuine in their love and care for the new believers who accepted the Lord in each of these locations. They understood that their work didn't end with just sharing the gospel. They knew that they also had a part to play in continuing the growth and strengthening and guiding these new believers in the faith. Let's look at verse 22. Verse 22 says, They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And they said, We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas believed that the, welfare, that the welfare of the infant disciples was more important than their own safety. The establishing of sound local churches that were flourishing with spiritual, spiritually growing Christians was of more importance to the apostles than the safety of their own lives. There's one thing that I've noticed here. One thing I noticed here is that Paul and Barnabas were doing the same thing Jesus did. In John 11, verses 1 to 16, Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, his friend, and he wanted to go to him in Judea. Jesus told his disciples his plan, but they told Jesus in verse 8, Come, let's go to Judea. But, 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 but Rabbi, the last time you were there, they tried to stone you. And you want to go back? As we can see, this did not stop Jesus. He insisted to prioritize the welfare of Lazarus. And while on their way, he found out that Lazarus had died. But Jesus still insisted to continue the journey. But there was a guy named Thomas who was not thrilled at this notion. Not thrilled at all. 
He said, Let's also go. That me. Again, back up. Sure, let's also go. That we may die with him. Let us also go. That we may die with him. Let us also go. That we may die with him. Sure, let's go. That we may die too. Jesus was not at all scared of the possible dangers that he would have to face just to encourage the sisters of Lazarus, Martha and Mary. Jesus was modeling to his disciples that being intentional in reaching out and encouraging those who believe in him takes top priority and it is of utmost importance that those in the faith help other believers in their journey with him. Now let's go back to Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas went back to these places because they knew that the new Christians, the new believers there, needed guidance so that they could self-feed and continue to grow in their faith. And the importance of self-feeding is still very much important today. But wait, you may ask me, P. Jim, how is self-feeding or what exactly is self-feeding? Well, I'm glad you asked. When we were babies, we didn't have the capability to feed ourselves and we needed someone to feed us, right? But as we grew older, we learned how to feed ourselves through various means. If you're hungry, you get food. In the same way, when we first start our discipleship journey in Christ, the ways we need to feed ourselves spiritually may not yet be very clear to us. You know, we, it's not clear. We don't know what to do. And we need somebody to guide and help us understand how to do it. Now, we can say we are able to self-feed when we no longer have to rely on other people for us to grow more spiritually. Now, self-feeding in this context is the intentional seeking of God through the reading of His words and intentionally knowing God. Not just in the worship services that we have, but in every aspect of our lives. This is what Paul and Barnabas wanted to show the people of the early churches. This is discipleship as we defined a while ago. Being intentional, surrendering of our lives to the Lordship of Jesus, and finding ways to feed ourselves daily with His Word in order for us to know Him fully. Both Paul and Barnabas were committed to helping the new believers. Both of them knew that. If they did not do a follow-up with the newly established churches, there was a big possibility that the churches might have lost their fire because they were immature. So they returned to ensure that this wouldn't be the case. You know what? It was not specified how long they stayed with them, but it was enough time for them to lay a good foundation for the disciples in these churches to be grounded in their faith as disciples of Christ. I personally like the fact that Paul, in his way of strengthening and encouraging, did not sugarcoat anything. He did not hide anything. He was real and told the new believers that there were going to be hardships and along the way, and he wanted them to understand that the tribulations that all Christians face is all for the glory of God. And Paul and Barnabas served as an example to this, sharing their testimonies of strife, strife with others, but showing them how rewarding it all was and it was worth it in the end. This church is how we should be 
Let us be like Paul and Barnabas. And let us be intentional in committing ourselves to helping our new brothers and sisters in becoming more steadfast disciples of Jesus. Like last week, seize the day to help others. Continue to encourage our fellow believers and do your part in showing God's goodness to all who believe. No matter no matter where in your Christian journey you are, there is always someone who can encourage or you can encourage to be more steadfast in the faith. Pray for that person. Find that person. And let's, let us do our part for that person. Paul and Barnabas were truly passionate about this mission. So passionate that they did not stop there. They did another thing to help ensure the spiritual stability of the believers in the new churches. Which brings me to my point number two, commissioning the leaders. After they left, Paul and Barnabas didn't want to just leave the people of this cities as they were. They wanted for them to continue growing and digging deeper and deeper into the Word of God. They wanted to continuously be encouraged and be guided towards Christ-likeness, and they wanted to ensure that this was continuously promulgated throughout the body of Christ. So what did they do? They chose mature leaders to continue this mandate throughout the churches. Now, these mature leaders usually come from leaders of their own households, which made sense because back in those days, family homes served as the Christian churches. Paul and Barnabas knew that in order for the work to continue, they needed to dis disciple and train leaders who would then raise up the next generation of leaders who would continue the cycle of growth. They just didn't lay hands and commission people because they are of their gifts, such as you know, being talented, being eloquent in speech, or wealthy. Now let's look at verse 23. We can see how they chose leaders based on the leading of God. And through prayer and fasting, they asked for God's wisdom to be upon these leaders and also with themselves as they appointed the leaders. Paul and Barnabas knew that the work of the church needed a proper body to lead in the administration of the works, so they appointed elders in every city where they were Christians. They showed their concern and was modeling to these leaders how to submit to God. Now, through their actions, they were stating that there was no stability without a God-ordained leadership. Let me repeat that. There was no stability without a God-ordained leadership. Paul and Barnabas recognized God's men fit for the office of elders through God's leading and appointed them as such in order to produce stable, growing, vibrant, and well-organized communities of faith. We are all familiar with the Great Commission verse, which is Matthew 28, 19 to 20, when Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We see here that we are all called to make disciples and to be a disciple as well. Being a disciple is the first step in fulfilling this great commission. We must intentionally self-feed in order to grow more in Christ so that in turn, we can make disciples who are grounded in the truth 
of the gospel of Jesus. Today we have Paul and Barnabas in this modern world that helps us train disciples and to become disciples. One of the Pauls of our time for me is the Reverend Edmund Chan. In one of his intentional discipleship conferences, which we attended in GCF South Metro, he said something that has left a lasting impression in my heart. And I was actually energized. My, energi my, my drive to know Christ has been rekindled. He said, Take care of the death of your life and let God take care of the birth of your ministry. This means that the growth of our inner self and the intentionality to submit to the Lordship of Christ in every aspect of our lives is primary in our intention to disciple others for Christ. We can see that Paul and Barnabas showed this and they wanted the leaders of the churches to be the same. Again, just like Jesus, they did not just merely instruct these leaders on what they need to do, but they committed them to God. They committed each leader to God first and showed them through their own life, through their own life testimonies and their own lives, how to disciple people just as God designed it to be. Jesus lived out all that he was teaching to his disciples. And Paul and Barnabas strove to do exactly the same so that they could pass this on to the next generation of leaders. I would like to take note, however, that Paul and Barnabas modeled their actions on Jesus and on his actions alone. They only taught others the teachings of Jesus and strove to solely make disciples loyal to Jesus Christ alone. Not to anybody else. Not to them, but to Christ alone. Their goal was to lead people to be a disciple or to be disciples of Christ. And they knew, just like a baby growing up, whatever the parents displayed in front of the child, this is what the child would absorb. So Paul and Barnabas were very, very careful to make sure that their actions reflected that of Jesus Christ and no one else, not even themselves. They, all, they wanted all Christians to be loyal to Jesus and to Jesus alone and not to confuse loyalty based on their love for their leaders. This also another very important principle for us to understand as disciples and also as disciples. Now moving on, Paul and Barnabas did one last thing based on our passage to further strengthen the disciples of Christ. Let's take a look at our third point, commending the Lord. It was not specified how long Paul and Barnabas stayed in each city they had visited. But after some time, they felt that they needed to return back to their home church. And this is the church in Syria, which is also called Antioch. According to Bible scholars and historians, they had been gone for some 18 months. And listen to this. They traveled by foot some 700 miles or 1,126 kilometers, and about some 500 miles or about 805 kilometers by sea. And I just find these figures mind-blowing. <laughs> Knowing how difficult to travel before, you know, they didn't have cars, they didn't have vehicles like the way we do. And what's mind-blowing is that they did this for the sole purpose of bringing the good news to the outside world. This was, their, this was their first mission trip. And boy, they covered a lot of ground. We could only imagine how excited they were to tell the good news of what happened to them on their journeys. And 
you know, we have seen how Paul and Barnabas had faced trials of many kinds. They never gave up, knowing that there was a great gain for the kingdom of God. So they gathered their home church, I'm pretty sure with much jubilation, they worshipped, and for sure it was a very magnificent celebration. It's a praise and worship celebration. But I would like us to pay, to pay close attention to verse 27. Let's read it. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. What do we see here? We could see here how they gave God the glory and acknowledged that it was God who made everything possible. Never once did they claim anything they accomplished was their doing. They gave everything to God. They commended God for His wisdom, for His guidance, for His protection, and love for them. And while they reported that what they were able to accomplish by God, they highlighted the fact that it was through God's grace that everything was made possible and every situation was made bearable. In the end, it was only God's grace that delivered them. And they told everyone how they had trusted God and how He never failed them. Acknowledging God in all things is something I strongly believe in too. Or something we should believe in. Our attitude and understanding towards God should be in line with the same thoughts of Paul and Barnabas. We need to acknowledge God in the accomplishments He allows us to achieve because it is truly His love for us that we were able to do this, that He always plans and orchestrates our success for as long as success draws us closer to Him. Sometimes, however, people attribute success to their families, their work, or even their respective ministries because of their own personal abilities. Now, the problem with this is that it blinds us from the truth and fills us with self-pride. And this self-pride is what will lead to conflict and turmoil in our lives and push us further and further and further away from the actual truth, which is that it is only through God's enabling that we are able to do what we are doing for Him. This is such a great encouragement for the disciples of their home church. When Paul and Barnabas shared all that God had done for them, it would be only natural for people to be encouraged, knowing that the God that they also serve truly was in control of all things and was true to his word. Now, Paul and Barnabas proved that trusting God's grace and power was the only way to go. Right off the bat, they continued in their discipleship mindset, now focusing on their home church. This was very evident in the way they gave glory to God. You know, they could have just reported that they suffered a lot and was almost killed. Many, many times they were almost killed, but no, 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 no. They didn't do that. Why? Because their joy trumped all of the sufferings they went through for the name of Jesus. When Jesus called us to go and make disciples of every nation, He was and still is telling us to trust in His power. 
And even in the midst of suffering, God wants us to know that He still uses all that is happening in our lives for our good. Paul and Barnabas exemplified this in their journey. And what was written in James 1, verse, verses 2 to 3? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Paul and Barnabas endured a lot, and they persevered knowing that there was so much to gain for God's kingdom. They could have just stopped when they were facing all those troubles, but they decided to keep pushing on for God's glory, knowing that God was waiting for them at the end of their journey with open arms. Let us also have the same attitude, pushing on no matter what. Let us keep on pushing on all for God's kingdom. Can I get an amen? We push on and endure in order for us to be a part of the Great Commission, teaching and discipling others as Christ instructed us. And know always that God is with us every single step of the way. This is not only a message to you, but to me as well, and all other pastors and church ministers in the Lord as well. As I wrap things up, Let's look back again at what Paul and Barnabas showed to us today in this passage. This actually made me reflect on my own discipleship journey and how I'm grateful and thankful that other Christians went out of their way to hold my hand, to keep on encouraging me, and guide me in my infancy in Christ. And thank God that he used them mightily to help me become who I am today for Christ. Allowing me to become mature enough to help others in their walk with Jesus Christ. Their encouragement and constant prayer led me to finding my conviction in Christ and peace in His absolute Lordship. So I would like to end my message with our definition of what discipleship is all about. And it is, discipleship is living a life of absolute surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ by intentionally knowing, loving, following, and serving Him. Getting to where I am right now was not as easy as I wanted it to be. Just like Paul and Barnabas, I had my own sufferings. Yet I am happy to have gone through them all because through my journey, I have come to realize that it's all about Him and not about I. And it is through this realization that true happiness and peace can be found. We can all emerge for Christ, emerge as a disciple who disciples others and encourages them to emerge as a solid follower of Christ who glorify Him in everything. Let's continue to encourage each other. Let's, let's continue to commit to the Lord the establishment of His people through much prayer and willful sacrifice and to trust God's grace in all we do for His kingdom. Let us continue to help carry each other and help one another in our walk and journey with God. Let us all abide and immerse ourselves in His words and follow Him when He says, Be intentional 
in prioritizing discipleship. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your message today. Thank you for reminding us that what we are doing is not for ourselves but for you. And for reminding us that we should prioritize discipleship in everything that we are doing. Lord, thank you for giving us the vision of what discipleship is. Teach us, Lord, to surrender to you, to absolutely surrender to you, and to intentionally follow you, love you, know you, and serve you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for putting this vision into our hearts. And help us, Lord, so that we could apply this, so that we could live as your disciples. Lord, check our hearts for anything that we have not surrendered to you. And compel us, Lord, to surrender to you. It is only through your help, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we are able to do surrender. Lord, I pray for my brothers and my sisters who are watching this right now, that whatever it is, Lord, that they have in their hearts, Lord, I pray that you touch their hearts, that you give them comfort, that you give them peace, Lord. It is only through your peace that we can find joy. Lord, continue to protect our land, continue to heal our land, continue to heal our hearts so that we may become true disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Thank you, church, and have a wonderful day. In the next two minutes, let us quiet our hearts and digest the message of the Word of God today. In this time of reflection, take a moment to answer the following questions.